Good morning, everyone. I want to issue a special welcome to uh, everyone who's gathered for worship today. I know that um, some of you are visiting, some of you are visiting family, so welcome. Thank you for spending uh, this time together with fellowship. We, we pray, as always, that this is time is uh, obviously first and foremost glorifying to God, but that it also encourages us in our own walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and grounds us further in the truth of the gospel. So uh, may our time together be blessed this morning. I thought I'd begin by reading from the words of Revelation as a call to worship. Um, oh, sorry, I have two announcements before I get too far into things. Um, one I want to mention is that this afternoon we do have uh, a church barbecue. It's going to be at the Van Ralties at 4 in the afternoon. Uh, dinner's going to be around 5. So if you have questions about that, then just come and find me uh, during the break um, after the, the service this morning. And I'd be happy to kind of give you uh, the info, the details around that. So that's one announcement. The other is that during our time of teaching, which I'll lead this morning, um, you're going to have an opportunity to text in questions and answers. So you can text those. You should have my number uh, on this here somewhere. Hopefully. Possibly not. It's there. Thank you, Sonia. So yeah, feel free to text me questions, and then afterwards I will take at least one or two of them. So uh, let's begin with a call to worship. Can I ask you to stand? This morning I wanted to focus in our time uh, together, our teaching on the righteousness of Christ. That's the theme that I want to focus on. And so I thought in that connection I would open with a call to worship from Revelation uh, chapter 4, which gives us a picture really of the, the holiness of God and of the Lamb. We read in Revelation 4, beginning at verse 6, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third li living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. As we come together for worship this morning, uh, I greet you with those words as well from Revelation. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Our first song this morning is going to be the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
me lead you in a word of prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, this morning we have the privilege of gathering with the saints of all times and all ages and falling down before your throne of grace and declaring that you are holy, holy, holy. We come together to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, to acknowledge worthy as the Lamb who was slain. And we pray that in everything that we do as we open up your word, as we sing together in worship, that everything that we do would be honoring and glorifying to your name. Would you help us to take our eyes off of the things that are here below and to fix them above where Christ is seated. Father, would you walk with us by your spirit, guide our hearts and minds, forgive our sins, and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, this morning uh, in our first uh, time of our, our worship here, the first portion of worship, I'm going to spend a little bit of time teaching about the righteousness of Christ. And so what I want to do is begin by reading from Romans chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open them up to Romans chapter 3. And I'm actually just going to read the verses 21 uh, to 26 together, where Paul speaks extensively about the righteousness of God that is ours through Christ. There we read these words, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So far the reading of God's holy word. Well, as we begin our time together this morning, I, I want you to begin by imagining the following scenario. Okay, I want you to picture the following scenario. I want you to imagine that one day someone comes up to you and they invite you, they tell you that you have won a free trip to Buckingham Palace. They come up to you on the street one day and they say in this scenario, this hypothetical scenario, they say, you have won a trip to come and to meet the queen and to dine with her. And that sounds pretty exciting because Buckingham Palace, it looks like an awesome sort of place to visit. And the queen, well, she seems like a really nice lady. And so all in all, this is a, this is a pretty exciting moment. But in this scenario, you are also dirt poor. You have no money to speak of. And you live a life on the streets. You don't have access to a lot of the amenities that uh, we're so accustomed to. You haven't showered in a number of weeks. There, there, there's dirt on your body. There's dirt under your nails. And the best clothes that you own, the only clothes that you own, they're kind of ripped and tattered. They're stained. They're dirty. And they smell. When this person comes up to you in this scenario, I wonder what your response would be. Would you be filled with excitement about going to Buckingham Palace and meeting the Queen? Or is it possible that you would actually be a little afraid, that you'd actually be a little bit nervous? Because you'd be thinking about how awkward it might be, maybe how embarrassing it might be for someone like you, looking like you are, to come walking into Buckingham Palace and to sit down with the Queen. Well, this scenario is in some ways not that far-fetched. Because as Christians, sometimes we can fall into this mode of thinking. The gospel tells us that we have an invitation to enter into the presence of the living God. The gospel is all about our invitation to meet the King of Kings. And yet so often in, in our daily walk of life, it seems like instead of actually being filled with the excitement of that invitation, we spend a lot of our time focused on our on our sins, on our, on our struggles, on our shame, and on our guilt. And deep down inside, we sometimes are a little bit afraid, a little bit nervous about the prospect of standing before the king. 
Now, Martin Luther, who was one of the central figures of the 16th century Reformation, he was someone who knew what it was like to live this way. He was someone who had uh, committed his life to, to being a monk. He joined a monastery. He wanted to devote his life to the service of the Lord. And yet he was someone who was kind of the definition of a Christian without joy. Because he didn't truly understand the gospel. Now, to be clear, he understood parts of it. Right? Luther understood the majesty. He understood the holiness of God. He understood the invitation of Jesus Christ. But he was caught up on his sins. And he was caught up on his struggles and his weaknesses. And then one day he discovered something that changed his life forever. He discovered the truth about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes this morning, about the righteousness of Christ. This is something that the Heidelberg Catechism addresses, uh, one of our confessional teachings in Lord's Day 23. In the previous Lord's Days, the Catechism has basically explained uh, the Apostles' Creed. It's laid out the basics of the Christian faith. And then when it gets to Lord's Day 23, it follows all of that, ask, all of that up by asking the question, how, how does it help you now that you believe it? And here's what the response is. In Christ, I am righteous before God and heir to life everlasting. It says, in Christ, I am I'm righteous. And you kind of go, okay, like how does that work? How did you go from being a, a, a struggling sinner to suddenly being someone who says that they're righteous before God? Well, the next answer is this, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. And then the catechism goes on to explain the following. I want you to listen carefully. Although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all God's commandments, have never kept any of them, and am still inclined to all evil, we could actually paraphrase that section and say, although every day my conscience actually accuses me that I'm not really good enough to enter the kingdom of God, here's the reality, here's what God does. Yet God, without any merit of my own, out of mere grace, imputes to me, gives to me, you might say, the perfect satisfaction, the righteousness, and the holiness of Christ. What the Bible teaches is that you're, you're never going to make yourself good enough. You're never going to clean your life up enough. You're never going to make yourself presentable enough for God. And if you read... Um, if you read about the life of Martin Luther, particularly uh, this time where, where he lived in the monastery, you discover that uh, there are very few people who were as devout as he was. I mean, he had committed large uh, portions of scripture to memory. He, he rose at ridiculous hours of the morning to commit time to prayer. He fasted. He would actually sometimes inflict pain upon himself just as his, as his act of repentance. And yet he was a miserable, miserable person. Because he, he, he looked so good, right? He looked so devout out there. But the problem was that Luther knew his heart. And he knew that the, the sins and the struggles that lived there. And so every single day, his conscience accused him. Instead of his, his religion kind of bringing him freedom, what it, what it did was it, it, he, he felt more and more burdened by guilt. And then one day he's reading through the book of Romans and he discovers the full extent of the gospel. He discovers that he can take all of his sin, all of his shame, all those secret things of his heart and he can bring them and he can just leave them at the foot of the cross. And he discovers that through faith in Jesus Christ that God washes him by the blood of Christ, that God purifies him and that he's actually robed he is now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And I believe that the reason that God spoke so powerfully to someone like Luther uh, through the letter of Romans is because the Apostle Paul, who, who, who wrote the letter of Romans, 
the Apostle Paul was someone who in many ways lived a similar life. The Apostle Paul, if you're not familiar, he grew up as a devout Jew. Perhaps we might say the, the, the most devout of the Jews. He was someone who also committed huge amounts of scripture. He committed huge amounts of scripture to memory. He was someone who, who, who regularly adhered to times of prayer. He was someone who followed all of the rules, and yet inside he was actually kind of empty. And then one day on the Damascus Road, he meets Jesus. And he discovers the gospel, and his life just does this complete change. And in Romans chapter 3, which we read just a few verses from, he's kind of describing the way that his life changed. Romans 3 begins by him saying, hey, like, look how good I was. Look how I did all the right things. And he says, I wasn't even close. And then he says this in Romans 3, verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. So he's saying it, it, the, the righteousness of God has been revealed to me. And I want you to notice this. He says, apart from the law. Paul says, I discovered one day that there's this righteousness of Christ that is available that's actually apart from what I do. Obviously, you go, okay, well, how, how does that become, become mine? How do I have that righteousness? And the very next verse, he says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. See, that right there, that in a nutshell, that is the gospel. And if you actually truly grasp the righteousness of Christ, that will drastically change the way you live. This was a truth that set Paul free. This was a truth that set Luther free. This is a truth that can set us free. The righteousness of Christ is actually where you find the joy I sincerely believe this. This is where you find the joy. This is where you find the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without it, you can have everything else. Without it, you can be that person who's completely devout. You can have huge amounts of scripture memorized. You can be regular in prayer. You can do all of the right things. And yet, deep down inside, you'll actually be kind of empty. Because when no one is looking, when there's no one around, your conscience will accuse you. And your conscience will tell you that you're you're not good enough to enter the kingdom of God. And the devil will come and he'll whisper in your ear and he'll say, look at you. I know what everybody else sees, but look at your life. You're not good enough. And he's right. But if you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Christ, then when your conscience accuses you and when the devil comes and says you're not good enough, then you can go, you're right. But my Savior, Jesus Christ, is. And through faith in him, I know that I'm washed, that I'm purified, I'm cleansed of my sins, of all my sins. And I know that I'm clothed, I'm confident in the righteousness of Christ, and he himself is going to usher me into the kingdom of God. You know, a number of years ago, I came across an incredible rescue story um, about a, a U.S. submarine. It was called the USS Squalus. It was a, a submarine that was built before the start of the Second World War, and at the time it was, uh, was state-of-the-art, state-of-the-art technology. Uh, but in, in, in May of 1939, before the submarine was actually deployed, it sank during a test dive. There was kind of a catastrophic malfunction. A number of the compartments took on water, and the USS Squalus ended up on the bottom of the ocean floor, some 240 feet below the surface with 33 sailors still trapped on board. When it failed to um, radio in at kind of the appointed time, there was this massive search and rescue effort that was launched. A vessel passing in the area saw these floating buoys that the submarine had deployed in order to kind of mark its location, and they made contact with the submarine. And they discovered that there were these sailors on board who were still alive, but they also discovered that the ship was completely crippled. There was nothing they could do. And so the U.S. Navy launched its, its first ever um, deep sea rescue mission. And what they did is they, they used something called a, a, a diving bell. And it was kind of this, this chamber that, that looked actually like a bell. 
It, it was a pressurized chamber that was built of these, um, just, just this huge metal so that it could withstand kind of the intense, intense pressure as it went further uh, and further down below. So they had this diving bell and they took a ship and they lowered it by a cable down to the submarine. And when it got to the submarine, they navigated it so that it, it, it actually locked onto the hatch of the submarine. And once it was locked on, they could open the hatch and about eight to 10 people at a time could actually leave the submarine and go into the diving bell. It was something that had never been done before. It was an incredible rescue. But over the next 40 hours, all 33 sailors were brought to the surface. It's an incredible story. And I think it's an awesome picture, actually, of the gospel. Because one of the things you need to recognize when you think about those sailors that were trapped down below was that they were excellent sailors. They were well-trained, they were devoted, they were committed, they knew the rules, they knew how to follow orders. But the truth is that no matter how hard they worked, no matter how hard they tried, how, no matter how well they followed all the instructions, they were actually in a situation that they simply were not going to make right. There was no way that they were going to bring this submarine back to the surface. And if they tried to open up the hatch and to swim out on their own, they would have just been instantly crushed by the pressure of the water. They were a group that found themselves in a hopeless situation. And I think as people in this world, that's where we find ourselves. And before anything else can actually happen in our lives, God has to open up our eyes to that reality. God has to open up our eyes to the reality of our sin and our consequences, of the broken relationship that we have and the alienation that we have from God. Now, a lot of people, and even a lot of religions, are, are willing to acknowledge that. But the answer that they give is, is to say, well, if you just do enough, and if you're just devoted enough, and if you just follow all the rules well enough, then you'll be able to make things right with God. And a lot of people try this, and in the end, they end up incredibly discouraged. And the reason that they end up incredibly discouraged is because their efforts are going to be about as successful as those sailors would have been in trying to raise that submarine back to the surface. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not about people working their way back up to God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all about God sending a savior down. It's all about God sending us a savior in Jesus Christ who comes down to us and who because of his perfect righteousness and his holiness is able to withstand the burden of God's wrath against our sin. Jesus Christ comes down and what he does is he offers us a way of escape. He offers us a place of safety. He allows us to stop kind of this frantic work that we're constantly trying to do of being good enough. And he offers us a place where we can just rest in his righteousness. And the only thing that he asks of us is that we step out in faith. I'm going to leave it there. Let me pray. And then we'll sing from the song Cornerstone. And if you want, you can text me questions during that song and I'll take a couple of quick questions. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the fact that you, by your spirit, have committed these words to writing, that your truth lives on throughout the ages. Thank you for the righteousness that you've given us in Jesus Christ. Father, would you relieve us of the burden of trying to be good enough, the burden that we so often live under. Help us to flee from this idea that we're going to produce our own righteousness and teach us what it means to rest in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. I want to invite you to stand, and as we think about the righteousness of Christ, we're going to sing the words of the song, Cornerstone.
Right, so I got a whole bunch of questions. I'm only, I'm just going to take a couple here. Um, one of the questions is, how do I know that I am truly righteous before God? It's a tough one. I think that's probably the one people struggle with, right? They say, yeah, I know the righteousness of Christ is there, um, that it's bind by, by true faith. Um, the question then is, you know, how do I know that I have faith enough, essentially? How do I know that I believe enough? Uh, my friend, Pastor Winston, um, uh, who's well known to most of you, um, he was speaking about this at a, at a conference in Calgary, uh, which I attended recently. And the example he used was he took two, sti two chairs and he placed one here and then he placed one there. And he put uh, a two by 10 across them. And the illustration he used was that he just, he was walking back and forth across the board. And the point that he was making was that, you know, your salvation is not on how well you walk across the board. Your salvation is possible because of the strength of the board. And his point was that your salvation is not possible, you know, because you have such strong faith. Your salvation is possible because of the strength of Christ. You might say the righteousness of Christ. And I think that's something that we sometimes confuse. You know, you are going to have people who uh, realistically, they just kind of crawl across the board. And getting across that board is, is, is every day uh, just an incredible grind. You know, the people who are just, they're on their belly just kind of trying to, to inch their way. You're going to have people who, who maybe are walking across more confidently. Maybe they're, maybe they're on both feet and they feel comfortable walking that way. And I think the reality is that for most of us, you're going to have seasons of, of both, which is why I think the righteousness of Christ is so important, that, w that we really kind of gravitate back there and, and have an understanding that we're not saved uh, because of our faith. We're actually saved because of the object of our faith, which is found in the righteousness of Christ. Let me, um, uh, let me take one more question here. I should have had a longer song because they keep coming in. So, um, sometimes you see what God offers and your conscience accuses you, but you can't bring yourself to reach out. How do we navigate that? So you, you see what God offers, um, but you, you, you struggle to actually embrace that. Um, I want to make a couple of points maybe on that. <clears throat> I think that one of them is that this, uh, this idea of the righteousness of Christ is twofold, right? It's really, really liberating on the one hand uh, when you embrace it. But the challenge, and I think the lie that the devil tells us constantly is, um, is this idea that we're not going to be good enough, which which prevents us from embracing it. That bird really is not helping. Um, wh what I want to say is this, like, we, we struggle with the idea of being completely righteous in Christ. And the reason why is because we all have struggles. Right? We all have sins, and so this idea of actually bringing them out and just being open and confessing them is kind of like that idea of the person who has to come before the, the, the Queen of England. And you're kind of going, well, I, I, can't actually, I can't actually tell people about these struggles and these weaknesses because then they're actually going to see me as I truly am. I think it's the, the incredible lie. That's where the devil constantly wants to keep us, is focused like inward, just looking at ourselves, and then we go, man, I do not want people to know me for who I truly am. But I think when you, when you understand the righteousness of Christ and the freedom of forgiveness, uh, it, it just reverses things, because instead of actually feeling guilty about bringing that, that, that's the most cleansing, it's the most purifying feeling, and if any of you have ever, um, have ever experienced this the way I have, when you've, when you've had to bring certain sins into the light, Yes, on the one hand, it's difficult, but it's, it's incredibly liberating when you understand uh, just the freedom, the righteousness 
of Christ that is yours. And so I, I think if you, if you want to experience that more and more, um, it's, it's simply about being honest about your weakness. I think as Christians, that's probably the number one area that we have to grow. Um, we're starting another small group season. I think if your small groups have been anything like mine have been over the past number of years, we, we, we're great at chit-chat. We're like professional chit-chatters. We can chit-chat the whole day away. But when we actually get into kind of the, the nitty-gritty and have to talk about, like, let's be honest about some of the things that I'm struggling with, you know, what are the areas where the devil's leading me astray? Suddenly the room gets a little bit quiet, right? And yet you'll find that you, you bond together so much more when kind of that first person or that second person says, hey, well, this is an area that I struggle with. And then suddenly it's there and you're like, okay, well, let me point you to Christ and remind you of how Christ loves you in spite of that sin. Um, so just some encouragement as we begin our study season as well. Uh, I'm going to close uh, this first portion with congregational prayer. Um, uh, just a, a couple things that I want to remember. Josh and Rochelle uh, uh, were married on Friday, so we're going to remember that in prayer. Uh, on the other end of the things, we, we have Hank and Yanni Buse who are going to celebrate their 60th uh, wedding anniversary this coming week, the 23rd. I visited them a couple of weeks ago and I was kind of bragging a little bit. That was my sin, I'm just confessing it. So I, I, I was bragging a little bit because my wife and I are about to celebrate our 15th anniversary. I was like, well, I didn't know this before. And then Hank informed me that that was a good start. So um, anyway, but a, a beautiful testimony of God's grace there. So we're going to remember that as well in prayer. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, um, we thank you once again for this opportunity to enter into, uh, to enter really into the throne room of grace, uh, to know that we are welcomed, um, to know that we are loved, to recognize that instead of having to feel like we are guilty and ashamed and burdened by our sins, that we are, we are able to look at ourselves knowing that we're robed in, an, in a righteousness that is not our own, but that is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, would you comfort and assure us of that? Would you help us to be honest uh, in our lives, in our relationships, in our friendships, about the struggles that we have, about the room that we have just for our own personal growth, and as we do that, that we would more and more just love and appreciate the freedom that is ours in Jesus. Father, would you help us to fix our eyes on our Savior day by day and to draw confidence in him. We pray that you would use us as a church community to stand as a strong witness uh, here in the community of Eldershot. Lord, we, we, we pray for those who don't know freedom. Lord, there are so many who are, who are still trapped, either trapped in sin uh, trapped by idols, even trapped by just kind of empty religion. And, and our hearts long to see them liberated, to pass from death to life uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, would you use us for that purpose? Would you um, allow us to be a strong light on the hill? And would you help us to use the testimony of our own lives and the grace that you've shown in our own lives uh, as a tool, as a means that we can witness to our neighbors. So, Father, we pray for that blessing. We pray for our, not just our, our city and our province, but we pray for our country. Uh, we think of the election tomorrow. And, Father, in some ways it's difficult because we look at the state of our country. Um, we look at the, the policies that we see promoted by various leaders and in some ways, our hearts can be discouraged. Lord, as we, as we think of a nation that seems to be slipping further away uh, from, from who you are and further away from what you call us to be in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you would grant us tremendous wisdom, that we wouldn't uh, even take voting as, as just simply a routine, as a, as, a, as, a, as a basic privilege, that we wouldn't just go through the motion, but that even in things like the right to vote, that we would prayerfully bring those things before you, that we would seek your leading and your will, but that also in the end, that we would trust that you are sovereign and that whatever the result might be, that you are still in control and you are working all things for the advance of your kingdom. Father, would you bless us also as we look forward to the start of another uh, study year, as we 
Look forward to a new season as a church. We're so grateful for uh, the people that you've given us, for the different strengths, weaknesses, and abilities, and for the way in which we can share in each other's joys and in each other's challenges. We rejoice this morning with Josh and Rochelle for the beautiful gift of marriage, for the commitment that they made to each other uh, this past Friday. And we look forward to embracing them in our church community and uh, striving to bless them as they begin their married life. But Lord, we also thank you that while some are beginning their married life, others have walked that road for a long time. And we think of Hank and Yanni and the celebration of their 60th anniversary, Lord. A, a wonderful, wonderful testimony of your grace. And we pray that you would actually use both sides of that spectrum, Lord, that you would use those who have, who have walked the road of marriage for some time to bless and to encourage and to mentor those who are just beginning. That we would really be that kind of community. That we're not stuck in our own individual stage or place, but that we collectively are the body of Christ. We are the hand and the foot that are building each other up into the head that is Jesus Christ. We thank you also this morning uh, for Logan and Hannah Reinink and for their son Lennon, who are just taking up their membership here in our church. Father, it's a joy to have them with us, um, to see them a part of our community here. We know that there will still be some sense of transition as they find their place in Fellowship Church, and we pray that you would use us uh, to make that transition easier and to see how we can get to know them and to serve their needs, uh, to encourage them to walk closer with the Lord Jesus Christ. As we continue our time of worship this morning, would you, would you help all of us in that regard? Or that more and more each and every day we would have a keener eye for the Lord Jesus Christ and a deeper love for him. But above all, that we would more and more actually learn to just rest, to rest in the goodness of Jesus. Help us to do that. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to take a break. I know we're running a, a bit long this morning, but the weather is beautiful. So we want to give you just some time to chat. And then uh, in a little bit, Pastor Mark is going to lead us uh, in, uh, in, in a sermon. Um, and then uh, I think we'll just give you kind of a two-minute warning in a little while. But uh, take the time to enjoy each other's company and to bless each other. And we'll resume shortly.